Good evening. Welcome to this evening's Bible study. Now, we've just finished or completed our study on the book of Job. So tonight, we were going to start on Isaiah chapter 1. But I decided before we delve into or get, get started into the prophets, what I want to do is give an explanation of what the prophetic office meant and uh, what it is. So tonight, we're just going to spend time talking about the prophets and the prophetic office and what all that means uh, before we get into our books of study. Um, and we are going to study all, all 17 of all of the prophets. So um, first of all, so let us get started. We're going to pray, and then we're going to go on and, and, and get started. So let us pray. Lord God, thank you for the wisdom, insight, and knowledge that we receive from your servant, Job. Job taught us to maintain our integrity in all circumstances, to always remember that you, Lord, are in control, that grieving is a part of life, that you take care of the unjust as well as the just, that we should trust you, have faith in you, regardless of our situation. We pray that the study of Job gives us strength when we are weak, comfort, when we are grieving, and confidence when we face challenges and afflictions. We pray, Lord, that as we begin our study of the books of the prophets, that you bless us with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, so that we don't bypass anything, so that we receive the messages that you want us to receive, and so that we are obedient to your word, to put your word into action when you call upon us to do so. Bless us, keep us, love us, and forever be with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So, uh, like I said, we're going to start uh, um, tonight with just talking about the prophets and what that, uh, what that actually means. So, um, I did have a scripture for tonight, and that's going to be Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. So, Hebrews 1 and 1, which reads, Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. So long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. So what comes to mind when you think of prophets? What comes to mind when you think of prophets? Do you think about someone dressed in strange clothes, staring into crystal balls and describing the future? Do you see prophets as strange people who serve God in strange ways that we do not fully understand? God prepared his prophets for a very special ministry. They brought the, design, the divine word to a people who desperately needed to hear it. So now before discussing the prophets, and because it has been a while since I have done a review of Israel's history, I want to do a brief review of the history which will lead us into our study of the prophets and the prophet, prophetic book, prophetic book. Um, the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch describes how God began to carve out a people for his name, a people who would become the nation of Israel. God established his covenant with Abraham, brought him to the land of Canaan, and gave him Isaac, through whom the blessings of the covenant continued. Isaac was the father of Esau and Jacob, and God chose Jacob to carry on his covenant purposes. Now, Jacob was the father of 12 sons who became the ancestors of Israel's 12 tribes. The patriarchal family eventually settled in Egypt and became a numerous people. The Egyptians enslaved them. But after the people spent 430 years in bondage, God sent Moses to deliver the Hebrews from the Egyptians. The Lord led his people out of Egypt to the foot of Mount Sinai, where he gave them his Torah, or his, uh, his instructions for holy living. The Hebrews persistently rebelled against God, and that led to them to 40 years of them wandering in the desert, or wandering in the wilderness. But God protected them every step of the way. Finally, after Moses died and Joshua assumed control, the people conquered the land that God had promised to their ancestors. 
But even though Israel controlled the land, the trouble was far from over. Israel's neighbors often attacked its borders. So within Israel, a lot of the foreign people resisted the Israelites' control. After many years of battling these enemies, the Israelites decided that they wanted a king. So under Saul, who was Israel's first king, Israel won some battles. They uh, strengthened their position in the land. But Saul did not fully follow the Lord, and finally he died in the battle with the Philistines. And then David, Saul's successor and one of Israel's greatest kings, conquered the neighboring people and secured Israel's borders. What David conquered, his son and successor, Solomon, exploited economically. And then after Solomon's death, the kingdom divided into north and the south, Israel and Judah. So Israel was, north, was the northern kingdom and Judah was the southern kingdom. Both Israel and Judah faced spiritual, so they faced many, many spiritual uh, challenges. Idolatry and other foreign religions practices, they, that's what challenged them. Idolatry and other foreign religious practices challenged and eventually crept into the people's faith. So that's what they were having the most trouble with. Many of these temptations had appeared during the wilderness and the judges period. And now God's people were paying the spiritual price for their failures. So then they had a, a religious compromises. So religious compromise increased as ungodly religious practices began enjoying royal sanction. Solomon had first accommodated his foreign wives. Remember, he married all those women. So Solomon had first accommodated his foreign wives' desires to worship their own God. And gradually, he began to follow those gods as well, which was what God had told them would happen if they connected with or married these foreign women. Jeroboam, the first king of the northern kingdom, took deliberate steps to ensure that Israel would remain distinct from Judah. He altered the dates of the Hebrew festivals, appointed his own priests, and established other worship sites in place of Jerusalem. And that created a whole lot of trouble. Under Ahab, a few generations later, Israel sank to its lowest spiritual depth. Although Judah generally fared better, uh, fared better during the, in the south, also they suffered spiritually during the reigns of many of its rulers. So Judah, they did better than Israel, the northern kingdom. And remember, Judah is the southern kingdom. Um, and Israel was comprised of 10 of the brothers, uh, 10 of the tribes, and Judah was comprised of two, uh, well, two and a half, because Judah was uh, consisted of Judah, Benjamin, and a half, well, one half Manasseh, so half of the Manasseh tribe, and the others were under, in northern Israel. So spiritually, they, Jew, uh, spiritually Israel was, tra was uh, troubled with idolatry and all the sinfulness at first, but now Judah was beginning to suffer in the same way. But they suffered a little bit less than Israel did because they, wasn't, they had better kings. They had more of the good kings than Israel had. Israel had a lot of bad kings. So by 750 B.C., major foreign powers began to emerge in the ancient Near East. These powers formed a threat to smaller nations such as Israel. Israel was a small nation, Judah, and their neighbors, because remember, they've separated now. During the following two centuries, Assyria, Babylon, and Egypt would all take their turns pushing into the Levant, which is the eastern part of the Mediterranean. Ultimately, they would bring about the downfall of Israel and Judah. But in the midst of all this, in the midst of all this, a crucial question needed to be addressed. Would Israel and Judah return to their God and their spiritual heritage, or would they continue to embrace false religious faith? 
because think about where we're at now. I brought, I've, I've, I've went through the history in a very quick way. So a short, uh, this is a summary of the history. So I've brought us from the beginning, you know, with Abraham on down, all the way down to or, or the 12 tribes uh, through the wilderness. And now we're at the exile period. So we've come, we've, we've come all the way down there. So now they have this question, this very important question. Would Israel and Judah return to their God and their spiritual heritage, or would they continue to embrace false, or false religious faith? At this key turning point in Israel's and Judah's history, God sent his servants, the prophets. So now, before I again tell you about the prophets or who the prophets were, let me tell you who the prophets were not. So before I tell you who they were, let me tell you who they were not. So first, the prophets were not hysterical babblers. The prophets were not hysterical babblers. Some scholars have portrayed the prophets as men who often went into frenzied trances and babbled uncontrollable, uncontrollably until the spirit of God left them. Then second, the prophets were not fortune tellers. They did not tell people their personal fortunes or their personal, personal futures as a psychic or a palm reader or a horoscope might claim today. As God revealed his future plans to the prophets, they revealed them to the people to motivate their hearers of, 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 to be holy and to be godly. The prophets had no interest and entertaining people with fanciful notions about the future. Third, the prophets were not religious fanatics. The prophets were not religious fanatics. There were not individuals who were always looking for the opportunity to have a spiritual argument with someone. A prophet is someone who speaks on behalf of someone else. A prophet is, a, is someone who speaks on behalf of someone else. Most often in scripture, a prophet is a spokesperson or a mouthpiece for God. Even though Exodus chapter 7 verse 1 speaks of Aaron as being a prophet for Moses. Exodus 7 and 1 reads, the Lord said to Moses, see, I have made you God, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. So that is what the Lord told Moses. The Lord said to Moses, see, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. And then Exodus chapter 4, verse 16 reads, he indeed shall speak for you to the people. He shall serve as a mouth for you, and you shall serve as God for him. So this is God telling Moses this uh, particular thing about Aaron. Aaron was going to be his prophet. Prophets, again, are the mouthpiece of God, conveying God's opinion, reactions, intentions, and his very words. That's what a prophet is. They are the mouthpiece of God, conveying God's opinions, his reactions, his intentions, and his very words. In other words, God's agenda, or God's program, was announced through the words of the prophet. They were known by different titles. One title was a nap, N-A-B-T, N-A-B-T, uh, which is a Hebrew word, which means one who is called, one who is called. Another, another title was a seer, S-E-E-R. Now this refers to the prophet's ability to receive rev revelatory visions. The prophets lived during the period from about, 18, well, from about 800 to 450 BC. And they served as spiritual messengers to God's people by the power of the Holy Spirit. The ministry of the biblical prophets seemed to be abundance 
around times of crisis. So whenever there's this big crisis is coming on, you know, God always gives us warning. So at this time, he would use prophets to warn the people about something that, that some type of crisis that was coming their way. So this would be their, their warning. So he gave them warnings before anything, you know, would come their way or happen to them. Whether it was the religious crisis posed by the worship of Baal during the time of Elijah, the political crisis caused by the Assyrians and the Babylonians threats, or the identity crisis, which the, which the post-exilic post community struggled, God used the prophets to offer guidance to his people in troubled times. They were servants. They were servants who saw God's will for his people and grieved deeply that his people fell so short from God's will. There were servants who saw God's will for his people, and they grieved deeply that his people fell so short from it. So now the prophet came from many different backgrounds. They came from many different backgrounds. The prophet Amos tended flocks and cared for sycamore trees before the Lord called him to the prophetic ministry. And you can find that at Amos chapter 7, verse 14. Isaiah often spoke directly to Judah's royal house. Jeremiah grew up among the priests of the village of Anathoth. That can be found at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1. God used the prophet's prior experiences to shape their ministries. So now, despite the differences in their backgrounds, the prophets shared many characteristics. So despite their differences, they shared many of the same characteristics. First, the prophets possessed hearts devoted to God. They possessed hearts that were devoted to God. They loved the Lord, and therefore they loved his words and his ways. They placed their commitment to him above all else. They placed their commitments to him above all else, even when doing so brought them trouble and brought them persecution. So even when they were going to be persecuted, even when they were going to be persecuted, they were still committed to the Lord. Second, the prophets possessed a strong sense of calling. They possessed a strong sense of calling. They had not chosen the prophetic role for themselves. They had not chosen the prophetic role for themselves, but instead, God had called them to this ministry, and he commissioned them for his service. So God called them to this ministry, and he commissioned them for his service. The knowledge that God had called them and empowered them for their task gave them strength to continue, even in the face of the most serious opposition. Sometime, sometime, God's call came early in the prophet's life. Jeremiah, refer to Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. At other times, the Lord took his servant from an established profession, and that will be Amos, and you can look at that again at Amos chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. But each prophet, each prophet knew his ministry was not his own, and that is very important, that each prophet knew that his ministry was not his own, and that that would keep them from becoming arrogant and prideful. He must live the life God had called him to live. He must live the life that God had called him to live. Third, the prophets were messengers. They were messengers. They were delivering messages that God had revealed to them. Delivering messages that God had delivered to them. Sometimes Israel or Judah persecuted the prophets because the prophets declared words of judgment against the people and the nation. So because they didn't like what the prophets were saying, they would persecute the prophets. Hmm. Fourth, the prophets were forth tellers, F-O-R-T-H. They were forth tellers, telling forth God's truth 
to their own generation. They decried the evils of their day and called the people to repent. They warned them that while the covenant brought many privileges, it also brought them many responsibilities, including justice, righteousness, and holiness. So the prophets were telling, for, were telling them things that was forthcoming to them at their, in their time. In their time. So they were forthcoming, telling them what was about to happen to them. Some of those warnings that I was just telling you about. So the prophets were, they, they, they were able to tell, they were forth tellers, F-O-R-T-H, forth tellers. They focused primarily on their own generations, though their messages contain many timeless principles. Since God never changes, the prophet's words continue to challenge his people and our society today. Fifth, the prophets were foretellers. And this is F-O-R-E-T-E-L-L-E-R-S. So the prophets were foretellers. God revealed to them the future, sometimes the near future, sometimes the distant future, and the prophets declared it to their own generations. So God also, he, they were foretellers, which meant they were telling the people of that time what was going to be happening to them, and they were also foretellers leaving messages that we are supposed to take heed to in this, in this time. They spoke of judgments and of restoration, of bad news and of good news. So sometimes they had bad news to share, sometimes they had good news to share. But they spoke to the people of their generations, and they spoke to the people of our generation. So they were forth tellers, and they were foretellers. So now, have you ever wondered who wrote down the prophet's words? Have you ever wondered who wrote their words? You know, what, how do we get these words? There were three possible answers. The first being some prophets wrote down their own words. Some prophets wrote down their own words. A prophet may have spoken to them or spoken, uh, spoken out in public before recording, or perhaps he wrote them down first and then proclaimed them to the people. Sometimes God instructed the, a prophet to write down his message as a testimony so that when the day of judgment came, people would see that God had warned them through his prophet. Second, some prophets used scribes. Some prophets used scribes to record their words. Barak, Jeremiah's scribe, he had a scribe, Jeremiah's scribe, recorded Jeremiah's words and sometimes even passed along the prophet's words for him. So sometimes he would tell what Jeremiah had told for him to tell. And these were all, remember, these are all God's words. Third, some prophets may have had disciples who collected their words and organized them into the books that we have today. And there were several different stages and the develop I told y'all it's a lot dealing with prophets. I told you. It's a lot dealing with prophets. Prophets are more than just what we normally hear. You know, somebody asks you, what's a prophet? And you'll probably say, oh, that's just uh, somebody that uh, give a message for God, somebody that hears from God. So as you can see, there, there, there's a lot of history with prophets, you know. So, um, and that's what this is. Again, before we get started into the book of the prophets, before we, well, into the books, of the prophets. I wanted us to understand the whole office of the prophets. So now again, there were several different stages in the development of the prophetic instruction in Israel. There's the pre pre monarchy period, there's the pre monarchy period, there's the pre classical period, and the classical period. So first we're going to look at the pre monarchy period, and you can almost tell what it is just from the word pre monarchy. The, prop the prophet the pre monarchy period. The prophet was a mouthpiece or a leader of God who spoke God's messages directly to the people. So the pre monarchy uh, uh, prophet would speak words directly to the people of God. The messages were usually about national guidance because God is leading his people, maintenance of justice, and overseeing spirituality among the people. So like when, when, is, when the Israelite history began, 
prophets often, often held positions of leadership. Think about it, Moses. Moses, he's one, actually one of the best examples of this. He was qualified to lead the people by virtue of his prophetic office. Later on, Deborah, she provided prophetic leadership during the period of the judges. And, 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 and you see, these are pre-monarchy. Uh, pre these are before kings. Monarchy is the king, the royal house. So this, pre this is uh, pre-monarchy. Pre so this is prior to the king. These are prophets that were prior to the king. So that's a period. That's a time. So that's the name of them, pre-monarchy pre prophets. So after Moses, the best example of a prophet prior to the monarchical era is in Israel is Samuel. Think about Samuel. Um, prior to Samuel appointing the first king. 1 Samuel chapter 3 relates how Samuel's prophetic credentials were established. You read 1 Samuel chapter 3, you'll see where God called Samuel. He, has, he provided essential leadership during the important transition to the monarchy. So we went from, from being the monarchy, you know, from before the king. So you remember Samuel appoint, uh, was Samuel anointed the first king. He anointed Saul. He anointed David. But he anointed Saul. Because remember, Saul was the first king. Remember, Saul, Saul is the first king of Israel. David is the second king. And then David's son, Solomon, is the third king. Then we go into Roboam and all the rest of them. So um, once Samuel anointed uh, Saul as the king, prophets became advisors to the king. So they went from being advisors or, being, or, or talking to the people or speaking to the people God's messages. They went from to telling the messages to the king. Second, let's look at the pre-classical period. And that's what it's called after the king. It's called classical and pre-classical. So this is the pre-classical period. The prophet in the pre-classical period was a mouthpiece or an advisor of God who spoke directly to the king and to the king's court. His messages were usually military advice and pronouncements of rebukes or blessings. Remember Nathan? Nathan used to advise David. Remember? He advised King David all the time. Nathan, Elijah, Elisha, and Micaiah were prophets during this period. They all advised kings. Third, we're going to look at the, uh, the classical period. The prophet was, again, a mouthpiece who was a social, spiritual commentator who spoke directly to the people. So this prophet spoke directly to the people. His messages were usually rebukes concerning current uh, condition of society and often led to warnings of captivity, destruction, exile, and promise of eventual restoration. Three major powers directly affected Israel and Judah's history. That's Assyria, Babylon, and Persia. Assyria, Babylon, and Persia. The prophets who prophesied during the period of the Assyrian domination were Isaiah, Hosea, Amos, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, and Zephaniah. Isaiah and Micah addressed the people who had seen Assyria expand westward and began to dominate political events in Israel and Judah. Now, this should sound familiar to all of you all who have been in Bible study because we studied these prophets already when, they, when the people were going into exile a lot. So remember the prophets, these prophets were talking to them when they were uh, in Israel and, when, and they, they had split, you know, the, the, the kingdoms had split. And these prophets were there talking to them, telling them, giving them instructions during this time and, and even prior to this time when they were uh, committing idolatry and, the, and the God would send his prophets to speak to them. So these prophets were talking to them during this time and we've read about them over in, in, in uh, Kings. You know, we read mostly about them in First and Second Kings when the Kings came, came into play. 
So um, uh, Zephaniah and Nahum prophesied at a time when Assyria's empire was crumbling before the onslaught of Babylon and its allies. The prophets who prophesied during the period of Babylonian domination were Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Obadiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. So Jeremiah received his call about the same time that Nabopolassar rose to power, and Habakkuk soon followed. And then Daniel and Ezekiel ministered as exiles in Babylon. Remember when, they, when we were uh, in Esther, when we read Esther and Mordecai, and I don't remember they were in exile. So, uh, and they, but they chose to stay in Babylon. They chose to stay in Persia. They chose to stay in Persia when the Israelite uh, King uh, Cyrus let them go back to uh, Israel. And so Esther's family, Mordecai, Mordecai decided to stay because he liked the lifestyle that they had started living. So he would not return with the Israelites when Zerubbabel took them back. So remember, they were able to go back. They were able to, when, when, when uh, God placed it on Cyrus, King Cyrus' heart, to let them go. And when they went back, some of the Jews did not go back. Some of them stayed. They chose to stay. They chose to stay. So this, this was, and remember, they were only in exile for, well, they were only, they were in exile for 70 years, which means, uh, which was because of the sab sabbatical years that they didn't do. So, um, the prophets who prophesied during the Parisian domination were Joel, Haggai, Ze uh, Zechariah, and Malachi. Now, Haggai and Zechariah urged the people to complete the temple and look ahead to what God would do with his people. Malachi challenged the people to give God their best in everything. Joel used a, local, a locust plague of his day to warn people of the day of the Lord. Now we're gonna study all those prophets' names that I just called out, so y'all can get ready. We're gonna start with Isaiah, and we're gonna go, which is, you know, the major prophets, and we're gonna go all the way down through the man, minor prophets, which our last one will be Malachi. So each prophet came with a message from God, and his job was to communicate that message. It is important to distinguish between the message of the prophecy and the fulfillment of the prophecy. There's a difference between the message of the, the message of the prophecy and the fulfillment of the prophecy. The message is found in the proclamation of God's words to the audience. The fulfillment comes in the unfolding of history. So each prophecy had a message as soon as it was proclaimed. Each prophecy had a message as soon as it was proclaimed, independent of its eventual fulfillment. The prophets themselves were not predicting anything. The prophets themselves were not predicting anything, but merely giving the word of the Lord. That's all they were doing was giving God's word. The prophecy was God's message. The prophecy was God's message and not the prophets. So when a prophet gave his message, when he proclaimed his message, even though he proclaimed the message, he could not tell you how that message was going to be fulfilled. All he could do was proclaim God's word, and then God did the fulfillment. Remember that when somebody's coming to you telling you that they're going to prophesy to you. God fulfills it. The messages of the prophets carried four different types of oracles. They carried four different types of oracles. Number one, they were, they, they, these, these were an either or, they were gonna be, they, they carried four different types. They were gonna be, there were indictment oracles, which, mean, which was an, a, a description of the offense, a description of offense. The indictment oracles were a statement of the offense. Pre-exilic, it focused primarily on idolatry, ritualism, and social justice. Post-exilic, <laughs> post -exilic, it focused on not giving proper honor to the Lord. So they didn't give proper honor to the Lord. That's after the exile period. So I'm talking pre-exilement 
and after post-exam. So judgment oracles, it's a second type oracle, judgment oracles, is punishment coming because of the offense. So because of that offense, you're gonna be judged. So this is judgment, come, uh, punishment coming because of the offense. The judgment oracles, oracles were, punished, were punishments to be carried out. Pre-exilic, it was primarily political and projected for the new future, near future. And then post-exilic, it interpreted recent or current crisis as punishment rather than projections of future judgment. And again, I'm talking pre-exile, so before they went into exile, that's pre-exilic, and then post-exilic. And, the, and the prophets were in existence during this time. And then there were instruction oracles, how the recipients were to conduct themselves. They had to conduct themselves a certain way. God's people, just as today, we have to conduct, conduct ourselves a certain way. It was the expected response. Pre-exilic, very little response were offered, generally returned to God by ending their wicked conduct. And then post-exilic, slightly more response was offered. More specifically, the responses were addressed to particular situations. So in certain circumstances, stuff happening, and they would respond. Aftermath or hope oracles is the fourth one. Development after the judgment or hope for deliverance and res restoration. It was, affirmative, it was affirmation of future hope or deliverance. They wanted to be, to be delivered of whatever they were going through or restored. They wanted to be restored. Pre-exilic, it was presented and understood as coming after an intervening period of judgment. Like I said, they wanted to be restored. Post-exilic, it was presented and understood as ex uh, expanding a protracted time period or a gradual time period. Um, so, so your judgment or your punishment that they were getting, it was going to be over a span or a period of time. And so they wanted that respira restoration, you know, especially post-exilic. The major prophets, the major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Five. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel and Daniel. I told you earlier there were 17. So guess what? The 12, the other 12 are the minor prophets. So we have the major prophets, there are five, and we have 12 minor prophets, and they are Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Michael, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. The major prophets, are not more significant than the minor prophets. They all had very important messages. They all had very important messages from God which were equal in their meanings. The difference between the major prophets and the minor prophets is simply the length of the books. The major prophets' books are longer than the minor prophets. So that's the only difference. It's not because these men are, or these prophets were, were more greater than these prophets, or these prophets sound better than these prophets, or these prophets deliver better messages than these prophets. That was not the case. <laughs> if, if you look in your Bible, you look at these, you will find that these five are just longer than the other 12. So that's how they were divided into major prophets and minor prophets. So. Their, their messages were equal and the same. You know, their message, were, the minor prophet's messages were just as important as the major prophet's messages. Amen, amen, and amen. So, our next Bible study will be January 20th, and we will be in Isaiah chapter 1. So, our next Bible study will be January 20th, and we will be in, we will begin Isaiah chapter 1. And like I said, as you can see, this study was kind of intense. I just really wanted you to know what a prophet, you know, what a prophet was before we delved into it and started, you know, uh, trying to study it. So uh, remember to go out and check out Linda's Tree of Knowledge, uh, where you will find various different um, devotions and, and, and sources, biblical resources to, for you to look at. So until next time, be blessed by God, be a blessing to others, be a person of God. Share your love, 
share your faith, share God's word, and share the fruit that you receive from Linda's tree of knowledge. Amen, amen, and amen.